just recently published, and uh, I'm not quite sure how to describe it, except that I like to think it's the kind of book that people will want to pick up over and over again and just read because it's funny, it's humorous, and whatever. But you've got to make your own decision about that. And I will read a brief chapter from it tonight, and um, we'll see how it goes. Now, it is being filmed for uh, YouTube. I'm going to put my reading up on YouTube. I come to accept that in this age now, to communicate, we need to use other media. And I, I, I really hit me home when someone said to me, when I was talking about constructing something out of Ikea, and said, oh, what are you reading the instructions for? Go to YouTube. And they just had me spell it out for you. So, and I've done a little bit on YouTube as well now. I think it's very important. It's a, it's a medium we, we should embrace, and why not? So we'll see how it goes. This, is a, this will uh, test the waters in, in so far as whether this will come across well as a reading. If anyone objects to possibly being filmed in the, you know, with the camera angles, then leave. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is chapter for this. These are the quotes. This is called the Chronicles of Jasper and Gary, and the subtitle is uh, Accountants with uh, Artistic and Humorous Ambitions. And I think uh, this blurb in the back is quite good. It says P.G. Woodhouse meets Groucho Marx in this witty and unpredictable account of romance, art, and sexual anarchy. A book to cheer you up and restore your delight in the written word. I really hope it does do that for you. This is the fourth chapter. It's written in kind of in the way that P.G. Woodhouse wrote a lot of his G stories, where he put them together in the collection, and there was sort of a plot that went along. And there is a plot on this, a cohesive plot. But the individual chapters can be read on their own, and they kind of fit into the sequence. Uh, here we go. This is entitled, and, and I think leading up to this, I can't even, I don't, I don't really have to summarize anything because it's, it's about these two accountants, Jasper, who's got these uh, artistic ideas, and the sidekick, Gary, who starts to write about what they're doing, and you'll get the gist of it all. And there are two women involved, at least two of you. So. A brave new, brave new world. The news came as a shock, and Jasper's atypically sullen and beleaguered face showed it. Gary, he croaked over the wall of our cubicle. Did you hear? Yeah. I mean, what else can I say? On several occasions, our accounting firm is called upon to perform audits on businesses or associations that have the IRS breathing down their necks. We're expensive, but we're far less expensive than an IRS audit. And the thinking is for the firm to do a preemptive strike, we being the preemptors. Generally, these things took over a month, and for the unmarried, youthful, and sharp-eyed set, among whom Jasper and I numbered ourselves, an enforced exile from the Big Apple had all the appeal of a death march. <laughs> it strains the organism, no question. I'd been as far away as San Diego on one of these missions, and that was a trial I barely survived, despite the weather. Because you see, San Diego just isn't New York, not by a long shot. Neither is Los Angeles, for that matter. OK, a week or two, but after that, don't tell me they're sending me to Siberia, I quipped, attempting to insert a note of gentle levity to cheer up my again best friend. I wish, Jasper replied, it's far worse. This didn't bode well. Duluth, I hazarded, are you kidding? Duluth would be paradise. No. Yeah. It can't be. Ask the boss. How could they? Maybe I deserve to be punished for the Catwoman thing. I don't know. In fact, I had just been admiring a two-page spread featuring Jennifer, masked, whiskered, and enveloped in a leotard whose resemblance to the unadorned human body was uncanny, hawking investment banking services in our in-house publication, Uncommon Sense. But I thought it was great, commercially perhaps, but not artistically. It's supposed to be commercial, in principle, but even in commerce there should be art. What does Jennifer think, I asked, hastening to elicit some sense out of his gibberish. You know, Gary, people are funny, and women are even funnier. 
She's been so caught up in the story role that she's really become impossible, at least on the set of a photo shoot. Won't take direction. Simple as that. Otherwise, as a girlfriend, she's a gorgeous dynamo, full of vim and endearment, and the man in me can have no complaints. Not so the artist. Yes, that was Jasper. So I did the only thing I could do, Gary. You can't overrule art. We're exes again. Jasper, my dumbfounded voice trailed off. He and Jennifer, after their first bell, were all the rage at the rematch. And at social gatherings, their impenetrable adoration of each other threatened to expose the pretended chemistries of other couples, Miranda and myself excluded, of course, for what they were, salt Peter masquerading as dynamite. I took a deep breath, which he confused for a lack of sympathy, and harumphed in a modern and not old-fashioned way, mind you, bringing us back to the other matter at hand, exile. I hear they've got a decent art museum there. I was trying to soften the blow. Yeah, it might serve as the Met's attic. Next thing I know, you'll be telling me what a thrill it'll be to run up the museum steps. You'll be touting cream cheese, cheese steaks, and soft pretzels, the mere thought of which. When's D-Day? Tomorrow. Come on, coffee's on me. I felt for the guy. On a good day, Philadelphia is tolerable. That is, when the sun manages to find its way past the particulate overlay shrouding the city, when the temperature registers between 65 and 75 Fahrenheit right after a rainfall that's washed much of the litter and most of the other visible filth away for a while, when you can find a bench in Rittenhouse Square that isn't occupied by a vagrant, and when you know that a metro liner will be leaving 38th Street Station with your person firmly ensconced on board before dark. <laughs> I wondered what kind of soul would be redeposited in Manhattan at the end of four weeks of not-so-good days. And if matters could be any worse, he'd be plying his trade, a trade, mind you, he didn't have quite possessed for that I did, shackled to a desk surrounded by lawyers, <laughs> Philadelphia lawyers. <laughs> well, the tide in the affairs of men that floods bore Jasper along like driftwood. But he promised to stay in touch, and I promised to enjoy the city for both of us, never suspecting that tides can also be the bearer of complications. Jennifer, despite her wealth and the ease with which she turned a penny into a dollar and a dollar into a yard, and a, well, you get the drift, she's gifted. Everything she touches turns to numerals far to the left of any decimal point. <laughs> of course, it helped that she was born with a trust fund already established for her, which leads me to a theory. Unlike those of us who have not been trust funded at birth, the Jennifers of the world have no fear when it comes to wheeling and dealing. The others, however, are so far on the side of caution, or so heavily on the side of irresponsibility, that multiplying the stuff never becomes exponential. Hence, a built-in friction between the investment banking set and us measly accountants, which has a personal cue. I knew how to make a few bucks add up, but Jennifer knew how to make them accumulate like a tangent. <laughs> but investment bankers also have a non-mercenary and possibly even human side to them, if you look hard enough. So when Jennifer stopped by in the aftermath of Jasper's posting to the outskirts of the civilized world, she was a bundle of humanity begging for consolation. <clears throat> Although not exactly the blubbering type, her eyes moistened, her lips trembled, and her extremely shapely bosom heaved, the bosom that had done a great deal to make their Catwoman initiative so successful. And I gave her, a, gave her shoulder a small squeeze as if to say, there now. That one small squeeze from a man led to one fairly giant squeeze from my kindness, from the woman. And the line between squeezing and caressing began to blur a bit <laughs> on both sides, as did the line between exchanging words and kisses. The complicating factor, however, was that Miranda, my current girlfriend, and another of Jasper's exes, whom I absolutely adored, 
happened to walk in at a particularly <laughs> blurred moment and had a great deal of difficulty understanding the sympathetic humanity of the exchange, <laughs> not to mention the infallibility that plagues the male half of the species. The analogy of the slippery slope doesn't really do justice to what happens when a very beautiful woman a very beautiful woman crying out for the reassuring touch. A very beautiful woman who has already been courted and can therefore skip preliminaries when the reassuring touch becomes reawakening, as was the case between Jennifer and myself. Well, at that moment, Miranda was rather one-dimensional in response. <laughs> <laughs> and Jennifer didn't help matters by not buttoning her blouse. <laughs> in fact, she removed whatever blouse was left as soon as Miranda slammed the door. And then the plague hit full force. That's what I mean about tides making things complicated. I, too, became driftwood. And by next morning, things became so confused, Jennifer was sleeping quite soundly by my side that I decided to do the only honorable thing. I called Jasper. That's a relief, he replied. At least you won't be breathing down my neck here in Philly. It's hot enough as it is. You know the humidity is 93%? And it's not New York humidity. Believe me, it's different. Well, that was a relief. And then having had that glimpse of Jennifer's exquisitely human aspects, I could feel myself wavering to such an extent that I would have eaten a cheeseburger if she suggested it. <laughs> but she didn't. Somewhere along the line, she'd taken a leaf out of Miranda's vegetarian cookbook, unbeknownst, of course, to Miranda or me, for that matter, and was now espousing a meatless culinary religion. <laughs> he says it's art, she scoffs, but I know for a fact it's because he was too cowardly to give up those disgusting ribs. <laughs> she may have been onto something. And the vegan lifestyle had only enhanced her looks. She had slimmed down a tad while still preserving amplitude where amplitude was called for, <laughs> which only made me more confused because it was Miranda who had persuaded me to convert to veganism in the first place. And I was now one of the ardent faithful, at least when hanging out with her, and most of the time even when she wasn't within earshot of the comestibles. When guys are confused, I think what happens is that we grow even more confused. And then we take our confusion out on somebody, usually the source of confusion, in the form of nitpicking. In my confusion, I recall that Miranda, who was not only a committed vegan, but a committed social utopianist or utopian socialist, I can never get it straight, but Marx figures pretty prominently, <laughs> often derided the conventional bourgeoisie practice of monogamy not to mention marriage. And on the occasions when she spoke a little too warmly of her fellow co-editor and practicing utopianist Emilio at www.wobblies.org, and I responded with a warmth of a different sort, she hinted at my being conventional, which rankled because of its connotations that I wasn't adventurous enough being an accountant, which I thought I had definitively laid to rest by agreeing to suede wrinkle pickers, two pairs, black and burgundy, and volunteering as a garment bearer in church during the PR stunt for the real things. So I began to blame a great deal of the slippery slope and tide in the affairs of men on her. If she had only responded with requisite, sympathetic, utopian, socialist understanding, then perhaps slope and tide could have been averted. When Jennifer awoke and, drawing no doubt upon her recent feline expertise, began to make a sound that was suspiciously like purring, there it was again, the flood, and I was as helpless as driftwood. I'd never really thought about the fate of driftwood, at least not seriously, until now. And over the next several weeks, it became clear to me that driftwood drifted until it either got tangled up or was deposited on the shore, or simply disappeared at sea. Sometimes all three, in various combinations, as I believed was happening with me. One minute I was floating down a river, the next lodged into a thicket along its banks. One minute cast along a sandy beach, and another meandering far into an ocean of unseen peril or bliss. 
Miranda had taken to giving me the silent treatment, which is typical for the woman scorned, even though I really didn't scorn her at all. In fact, whenever I ran into her and her boots, I was besotted despite her silence. By the same token, in the company of Jennifer, I broke out into inner and outer smiles, and Miranda's silence became inaudible. Jasper, too, was silent now that his tour of duty had been extended indefinitely, poor guy. So I turned to the only person I felt I could turn to while on the horns of a dilemma, my father. Dad was a bit of a drifter himself, eventually drifting my mother into leaving him. But at least he had some experience. <laughs> I rang his mobile, and a young woman answered, obviously not Dad. Hi, uh, this is Gary. Hi, Gary. It's Julia. Oh, hi, Julia. Don't you remember me? The real things? The viola? Oh, yes, yeah, of course. Hi there. Yeah, how's it going? I was attempting cheer. I'll get your father. I let it pass. When I explained my predicament, all that dad, a criminal defense lawyer by profession, could say was, you traded Miranda's boots for a cat suit? Are you nuts? Don't get me wrong, Jennifer's a knockout. But Miranda has that, he called Julia, what's that French expression, honey? You know, the I don't know. And then nearly blew my air off. Miranda has that je ne sais quoi, not to mention those gorgeous, absolutely stunning Italian boots. <laughs> he paused for a minute, and I could hear him speaking away from the mouthpiece. It's my son's ex. How can you be jealous? The booming resumed. Look, kid, I gotta go. Women. So much for dad. I was obviously now on my own. Driftwood wasn't how I liked to think of myself. It was time to make decisions. Time to be decisive. Time to show a bit of steel and metal. It was time to cross the Rubicon, but not as a log. Strangely enough, the die was cast before I had truly prepared myself. It was a cool spring Sunday morning, and Jennifer and I were sauntering along Central Park West not far from the Museum of Natural History, when who should be sauntering in the opposite direction, unavoidably, but Miranda. Miranda and Emilio, the socialist, the utopianist, or whatever it is he called himself. <laughs> I was struck by several things. First and foremost, Miranda was wearing an exquisite pair of ankle boots with fascinating leather work and heels that accentuated her very shapely calves. And <coughs> OK, you get the picture. <laughs> Emilio, on the other foot, was shod with suede burgundy Chelsea's, chisel-toed, and near enough to my own burgundy suede items to cause a jolt, though the heels were pathetically conservative. His hair showed traces of the stylist's rather than the barber's touch. The most outstanding of Jennifer's plethora of physical virtues resided in the upper regions, where Miranda, who really had nothing to be ashamed of in that department, felt most vulnerable. And as we closed in for the showdown, Jennifer's virtues were standing out. We all four ground to a halt, and it was eventually Jennifer who broke the ice with, it's so warm, I might as well take this thing, her cashmere sweater, off. And that thing led quite uncomfortably, but I suppose necessarily, to a, why don't we all take a coffee at Mallow's from Miranda? angling for an opportunity to show off her linguistic ability through retaliation. At Lalo's, both she and Emilio took to ordering pastry in a French that seemed far too precise to be genuine French, though Jennifer didn't seem unduly phased. We spoke of this and that, of cats and men and whatnot, but not of it. I didn't mind the way Emilio took Miranda's hand and stroked it. And I guess Miranda didn't mind Jennifer gently massaging my shoulder from time to time. But what turned driftwood to jelly was something I hadn't expected. As we were sipping our espressos, I received a text from Jasper. And when I casually mentioned his name, Jennifer, showing a look of utter disgust, exclaimed, I don't know how much longer I can wait for the damn divorce to come through. It was probably no coincidence that Miranda and I spilled the remains of our espressos, <laughs> or is it espressi, on our footwear, because we were both leaning forward when the thunderbolt struck. 
Emilio, having never met the man, simply went on sipping as if nothing of moment had been uttered. Somewhere out of the depths of my high school studies in chemistry, I seem to remember something about changes of state and, and about how, for example, not only might wood turn into jelly, but theoretically at least, jelly might just as easily turn to wood under the right conditions. It was time to put the theory to the test. Jennifer, I said, rising, let's go for a walk. Excuse us. I led her into Central Park with steps as firm as if I had been wearing sneakers. It took several laps around the reservoir for me to get the full story out of her, but I got it. How, at the height of the Catwoman campaign, she had proposed and Jasper accepted, a move she now bitterly regretted, she said, <laughs> though fortunately she'd had the foresight to draw up a prenup as airtight as a bathysphere. <laughs> as I soaked it all in, I thought of that age-old antagonism, that inbuilt opposition which no amount of acculturation or appeasement on either side could check, that endless war between two species so complementary but so utterly different, so essential to each other's welfare, but such ultimately impossible bedfellows, investment banking and accounting. <laughs> <laughs> well, all this drifting hasn't been just my hobby. The others have also taken it up. Emilio, who was gay, something I missed in my state of confusion, <laughs> has begun to consult Jennifer about investments, socialist though he is. Jasper, adding aftershocks to the quake, speaks quite openly and without shame about the charms of Philadelphia, where divorce lawyers are plentiful in case of need. And Miranda and Jennifer are freely exchanging recipes, now happy to share. How much luckier can a guy get? <laughs> Thank you.